this is Dave Beatty, and I'm talking to a Navy veteran, a Navy veteran um, named Ryan Weigelt. And yeah. Ryan contacted me via email basically after seeing the film The Nimitz Encounters. And um, at the end of that movie, you know, I asked people if they've had any experience or have any knowledge of uh, these events to contact us. So Ryan reached out to me. So, hey, thanks, Ryan. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's not a problem, Dave. Glad uh, um, we can get in contact with each other. <clears throat> yeah. Um, Ryan explained to me that he worked on the air detachment on the USS Princeton back in, um, you know, 2004 when these events happened off the coast of San Diego, California. And he said that the air detachment basically is are the helicopters that are assigned to the cruiser. So, um Ryan, maybe you can just tell people a little bit about your Navy job and, you know, what your rank was, what you did with the helicopters back at that time. Uh, during this time, Dave, I was a leading petty officer and I was going out training a couple of detachments to go out to see our command, HSL 43. They did not have enough trained up detachments to go out to see. So I got tasked with training all of these guys out there during this time frame. Basically, I'm a power plant specialist. I worked on the power, power plant systems of the helicopters, but I also was in charge of training the whole detachments up to go out to sea. So you said you were like a lead petty officer. Is that your rank or how does that work? Is... Uh, it was just like a job title. My rank was E6. Okay. So um, in your capacity there with those helicopters, um, how many people did you oversee? And I mean, was it sort of like you were in a supervisor position? Yes, I was. I was supervising everybody on this detachment at the time. Um, a typical typical detachment, depending on how many helicopters you have, if you have one or two, can range anywhere from eight personnel to 16. Uh, this time we had two helicopters, so there was at least 16. I think there might have actually been 20 guys out there at this time because of all of the training that was going on, <clears throat> but I can't really recollect for sure. With your, with your detachment, um, which was called HSL-43, which I guess stands for light um, helicopter anti-submarine um uh, you're are you permanently on the princeton or is it sort of like you're assigned to it no we get uh temporarily assigned to a ship for small cruises so when they get the to do their workups a the ship uh they have to go out with the helicopter so we'll get assigned from our command over there so we were detachment five at the time this was a detachment five and then there's other, like, for instance, on USS Nimitz, there would be another detachment, perhaps a different squadron, perhaps that are assigned. Yeah, that, that. that would be a, a different HS command would be out there. Mm -hmm. It's changed today. Now it's it's the way they're doing things today is completely different. But I read that. Yeah, they changed. It's like Marine Strike Squadron or helicopter. Strike. Yeah, they've changed them to HSMs and they they supply the whole battle group. So it used to be. The HS would supply the carrier. The HSL would do the small ships. Right. But now an HSM command just does the whole battle group. So maybe, can you describe, um, you know, what the helicopters did? I know they do search and rescue, but what was sort of um, your guys' mission? We do everything from anti-submarine uh, to data link, you know, extending the ship's uh, radar. Uh, we've got the whole battle group, so we can link in with the whole battle group you know, through our data link systems as well. <clears throat> but, um, and, and when I it don't says remember, we were just doing, I would guess, you know, anti-submarine warfare exercises because we were doing a workup. It was the last workup before the long cruise. So you guys sort of protect the battle group. Um, you got, we, go we, up there, we them down. protect the carrier. Everybody protects the carrier out there basically. And from what I read, you know, on the internet, it looked like these helicopters had the capability of, you know, pretty sophisticated radar system and a, um, yes. a, a forward looking infrared system. And yes. uh, um, some of them, I guess that it was called the LAMP system. They had detectors, I guess, that were used to detect submarines, right? Magnetic anomaly detectors. And that yes, they would learn yes. To so and then, of course, there was offensive weaponry that these helicopters could use to, for instance, in a, in a wartime theater to attack enemy subs or ships and things. Um, on Princeton, there would have been two helicopters, right? Yes, we had two helicopters out there during this time. 
And with your crews, basically, you explain you you really can't launch two helicopters at once because there's not enough space on a cruiser. So there's a hangar bay, and you kind of move them in and out of these two hangars. Is that right? Yes. Or actually, it's one hangar. Sorry, I'm getting my ships confused. It's one hangar, and it opens up, and you've got two aircraft side by side when they're okay. packed in the barn. And then, you know, they pull back to the same track. So there's two different, they're called recovery assist secure traverse devices right. that move them in and out of the hangar. Well, I mean, can you um, take me through kind of like what a typical day, you know, not with UFOs, but just a typical day. Like if you guys were out there, you know, doing workups and the Nimbus is going to um, be doing um, aerial defense exercises what would like a typical day look like with your helicopters and how are they moving? How are they take, you know, do they fly all the time or maybe walk me through that a little bit? Uh, we typically only fly one helicopter at a time. Uh, we save us a, a helicopter inside unless it, for in case of emergency, it's kind of dangerous to take two helicopters for one small ship out at the same time. If there's an issue landing one or something like that, that other helicopter doesn't have a place to land. But so they're typically a helicopter that sits inside and, and waits in, if just to save hours. But you do anything that the carrier needs. You supply, uh, support their flight schedule, basically. Would your helicopters be launched if, for instance, Nimitz was going to be launching uh, aerial training? That would be something where your detachment would provide support, either search and rescue or just basically standing by, or how would that work? It depends on what the flight schedule for the whole battle group is. So we would submit our flight schedule for what our operations are for that day. So we typically do operations that support whatever the cruiser needs us to do, not necessarily the whole battle group or, you know, the carrier, because they have their own helicopters. So we really do more of what the Princeton needs us to do. But then the flight schedule goes over to the carrier, and they decide who does what flights. So if they need you to do something, then they'll put your aircraft in there and let you know. Right. And you also mentioned that the electronic suite that are on the helicopter, in, in there's a three-person crew, as I understand it. There would be a pilot, a co-pilot, um, tactical officer, and then an enlisted guy that would be the, like, you know, the warfare suite yeah, or the sensor operator. he's a sensor operator. operator, so he would be the guy who can, can not necessarily, the pilot can also do this, but they operate the FLIR system. Mm -hmm. That's the forward-looking infrared that you kind of spoke about earlier. So it gives us a camera that the ship can now see what the helicopter sees wherever they're at. Or if we link into the whole battle group's data link system, we can transfer pictures from other aircraft to ships and record them as well. So it sort of also uh, functions as a, a networked um, battle group system where, like you said, you can share um, radar picture or FLIR, the FLIR and comms and the, you know, to provide that um, extended view. Is that right? Yes. That gives us a pretty good idea of, you know, you know your, what you guys were doing and what your um, squadron's role was. Now I'm going to move over to the, the stuff that you contacted me about. And um, you had mentioned that, you know, during November, you became aware that some stuff was going on, basically because um, of your clearance um, as LPO. Sometimes you found yourself down in Princeton's Combat Information Center, um, yes. you know, talking to other squadrons or other detachments and so on. Maybe just tell me about what you remember from that week, what was going on before any of the stuff went down. Well, <clears throat> I knew that something was going on with something out there, and I have no clue. I wasn't really paying attention. When I'm inside combat, um, I was talking with other ships on uh, with other detachments during the time, so I've also got what I'm currently doing going on. But I, you know, I was able to see video of the FLIR system of these UFOs that uh, you talk about in your documentary. And do you remember, um, I, I know when you first emailed me, you said that you were aware of um, Senior Chief Day. Did you have any idea that they were tracking unknowns, you know, on the no, spy one? No, I, I didn't. I had a lot going on. And Senior Chief Day, Senior Chief Day his name was being called over the comms during this time frame, no bullshit, every few minutes. Mm -hmm. I mean, if he stepped away from combat, his name was getting called a few minutes later over something. 
I mean, they were always calling him back into combat, which kind of seemed odd. That I, and I remember this. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, it, it seemed from the other, uh, you know, shipmates that I talked to, there was kind of like a scuttlebutt going on in the smoke deck, and you know, like the whole ship kind of knew something was going on, even though some of the enlisted guys knew. And w- did you find that too? I know you were in a detachment separate from the, um, you know, the, the surface sailors, but did you hear stuff like? Well, I I heard people talking about something in the water. Mm-hmm. I, I I heard. Um, and I could not tell you where I heard this. It, it probably came from a debrief, a, a flight debrief. But I remember them talking about disturbances under the water that they, you know, they were seeing and, and that they were tracking something above the water in the air prior to this happening. So I heard about that. I heard uh, Senior Chief Day talking about a couple of things. And I couldn't remember exactly what, but I just remember associating back then, you know, there was something going on that was a big, you know, real world scenario that was going on that I just didn't really understand. You know, I was just listening to Senior Chief Day's um, comments and, you know, it was during the week of November 10th that he was tracking these objects with his team, you know, in anti-air warfare coordinator suite there, that console. And he decided to talk to um, Captain Smith and, you know, let him know that, you know, with the upcoming ADAX, which was scheduled for November uh, 14th, I believe, that it would be a good opportunity to interrogate one of the radar tracks, one of the unknown radar tracks. So it, it had been going on, according to Chief Day. But then you said that you kind of were aware of, on that specific day, you just mentioned that you saw the FLIR footage. Now, do you remember, or do you have any idea if what you saw in CIC was like a recording of it or if it was the actual it was what I saw was live it wasn't it was being recorded by the ship and whatever aircraft every aircraft that has a flare system has a video recorder as well Mm -hmm. now (laughs) I know on our helicopters our video recorder good luck if it was actually working or not I I don't think any of our video recorders actually ever worked but you know in the ships they they're recording this stuff as well but what was going up in, in combat during this time was I was looking at live. And do you remember um, any details? I know it's a long time ago. I mean, obviously, the, you've seen the film that's on, uh, the, on you know, YouTube. The f- and Yeah, the film, what, what you see in the film is, is really what I saw. I mean, it's exactly what I saw. Now, I, I'm not sitting, telling you I'm sitting here st- staring at this for the whole 10, 15 minutes. I mean, they're having a conversation with another ship, Mm -hmm. but it's definitely what I saw. There has been some contention with the, um, the strike fighter pilots that, you know, somebody said there was a longer version that was, you know, perhaps up to 10 minutes in length. And, um, the one that's on the internet, it's less than two minutes. You know, it's like Mm -hmm. a two minute little clip that switches back and forth from TV to infrared and so on. Yeah. And they say, that's all there is. And I mean, do you have any idea if that's, can you go either way or you don't know? I would, I would tell you that's bullshit. I mean, just knowing that the ship is recording everything at the time. So whether or not it leaked off of a ship or not is a different story. But I mean, but do you think there was, it was longer than the minute? 40 yeah. Oh, seconds? No. It was a lot longer than a minute or two. The FLIR, like when you were sitting there, ta- you know, kind of, it was playing it was, you think it was longer than two minutes, like what you yeah, saw. Yeah, no, I was, I was in there for a, quite a while. It was on the screen the whole time. I, right. I, I, I cannot tell you how long I was in there because, you know, God, this is a long time yeah. ago. But I was in there. I was called in there to have a conversation with another detachment about something that was going on with one of their helicopters. So I went in there, I had my conversation and I left and it was playing the whole time. Mm-hmm. It was on I mean, when I walked into combat, and it was on when I walked out of combat. You know, I don't know the systems that, obviously, the Navy has. I'm not an, an aviation or an expert on the transmissions and all that. Um, Gary Voorhees, you know, he swears that there was a, a capability of having a live feed in from the jets um, over some digital link. that they there, could, Yes, there's live uh, video footage on that you can see in inside combat yes so if it, it to me you know just kind of logically thinking that if the wizzo in the jet turns the at flare on and starts you know as soon as he powers it up he could perhaps begin sending that 
to the sh the the ships um, to send that information to the the commander. They, right? they are sending that information to us. If 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 Senior Chief Dave was asking for this information or any jets to go do any of this, mm -hmm. these aircraft are linked to the Princeton at this time. There's right. a direct link. We have comms with them. We have their flare footage. We've got every. We can see everything that jet's doing. We could see that what the engine's idling at if we wanted to. Right. I mean, everything that aircraft is doing, the ship can see. Right. And then if if indeed that system is real time, what I would call a down a video downlink. Yeah, it's, it's they, done through data link. They could record the whole thing. So, yes. you know, I, I mean, I find it hard to believe that the the tactical uh, fighter jet would only turn on the recording or the system after they've, um, you know, done an intercept and they're actually trailing or have locked up at this object. You would think they would start um, the system before they even got anywhere near the object um, as yes. they were being talked into. Well, if, if they weren't doing it in the aircraft itself, they mm -hmm. were doing it on board the ship. It's right. that's no matter what. Yeah. You that know, if sense. we're getting this stuff, it, our ship, you know, our systems, it's downloading all this information. It's saving yeah. all, all this information. So if anything needs to be looked at, we can look at it. Right. I mean, I think that some of the the Navy equipment specialists can look back over the years and say, well, you know, um, on this year is when they began doing these downlinked videos. And I think some of those systems are probably classified systems. So it's not going to be out there. You can't just go Google, hey, when did the video downlink begin well it says 2007 here but well maybe, I, whether maybe it says 2007 or not I, I could tell you that in 2001 i it, was it was a working system that i saw right and that's yeah. that's not breaking any anything in, in saying that you know that's right in 2001 that was an old 1980 system that i was working on right. and maintaining so Right. And you said that in your detachment, your air detachment, the helicopters could feed the FLIR video that, that they were seeing in real time back to yes. the ship. Yeah. Whatever, whoever wanted to see it. Well, it seems like that would whoever make we sense. Were linked to. That would make yeah. sense because you would want the tactic, the people that are doing the tactical, um, you know, warfare coordinating that would be able to look at the, that information it would be very helpful in real time. So it makes yes. sense. Okay. So, you know, I just, that's interesting stuff, you know, and I, I think that there's a bunch of people that saw what was going on in combat on that day and that week leading up to the intercepts. But you contact me and you said that you had specific information about people that came aboard the the Princeton after the FLIR video, after these intercepts. Maybe just tell me what you saw. So uh, I remember some Air Force guys coming in plain green flight suits. And they flew aboard on board another helicopter and hot seated into our helicopter and went off and took our helicopter off mission to do some other stuff that night. When they came back from the flight ops, I was there. They brought in some, some stuff and some bags. We put our aircraft to bed. I went to sleep. Uh, when I woke up the next morning, I got a call over the uh, 1MC of the ship from the CO to go to the bridge. Uh, when I got out from my berthing up to the top of the ship, uh, we were in San Diego Harbor. Uh, I was handed a cell phone from the CO of the ship, and it was my command telling me that one of our transponders, something from our aircraft, was taken, and we needed it replaced. And these are pieces of a uh, secure hardware that's tracked. There is a physical log of where these, you know, boxes are, and it's extremely, you know, it's it's locked up stuff. I thought it was kind of odd that. The Princeton left the battle group in the middle of a cruise, and we were in San Diego Harbor. They dropped off the guys that were with us, that they were collecting whatever from the other ships, I guess, and then rode our ship back into San Diego Harbor. I'm going to like go back just to kind of step through that one more time, because I think that from people that are hearing this for the first time, it's a little confusing, the, the kind of... Um, you know, sequence of events, but it's from what you told me, it sounded like some guys, you know, basically arrived on the Princeton that were not assigned there. And they, these guys had a, the purpose to, well, you said they got onto your helicopter and they flew off for a while and then they came back and that yeah. they, and that when they came back, you noticed that these guys had green flight suits on, but, yes. but they weren't really, you know, assigned to the Princeton. No, they were just playing. They're like what anybody would wear. So if, if 
there was anybody who was going inside an aircraft, they're going to get a plain green flight right. suit, no name on there. We don't know who you are, but for some reason, we need to move you from here to there. And, and in your experience, I mean, you've seen those types of personnel before. Oh, um, it happens all the time. And they're sort of given carte blanche, meaning that these guys have some sort of rank that allows them to do what they're, they're here doing. for a reason to do something that they need to do and you need to just stay the hell out of their way while they do it you mentioned air force and i know that patrick hughes said that but did you are you sure or you just said oh, that? i'm positive uh, you know i I've, I've been in the military for at least 10 years during this time frame so i know ranks i know ranks of other military and these guys were air force okay so from the uniforms i could see underneath of the flight suits it was an air force uniform um, Gary Voorhees, obviously his story's already been out there and I'm sure you've seen it in my film and everything. He said yes. that, you know, he was working crash and smash duty that when these guys came, then he was called down to combat because it was his job to sign out chain of custody of CIC's, uh, data tapes. Apparently from what I gather, these were the same people that, um, most likely did that, right? The same. Yes. That has to be right. the same people. And From hearing his story and knowing what I know personally, that they're the same people. These people, and again, these are not men in black making fun of it, mocking it, and saying these guys are lying. No. These no. are these are probably some type of um, you know military official that has rank that's obviously doing this, and they're there for a reason. Again, yes. I don't know <clears throat> if you know how they got there so fast, but it's not that far away from the bases on land, right? You know, every day you'll have aircraft land on your ship that don't belong to your ship that need fuel or need to drop something off or somebody needs to come over and do something and they drop them off and they leave a little bit later or, you know, they right. stay. So it's, it's definitely something that happens all the time. And it's, it's like a 30, 40 minute or even less flight to like North Island Air Station or one of the, oh, the yeah. other naval it wasn't naval a far It wasn't a far flight at all. So these guys, um, you noticed that they, when they got up the helicopter, they had a bunch of stuff. Is that correct? And you said that they brought it aboard? They just had a bunch of bags with them in the aircraft, and they brought it with them. You know, then when they got off the aircraft, you know, they come inside, they've got their bags with them, and they just walked from our hangar straight out uh, to wherever they were going. Um, you mentioned to me before that they... They were staging in, did you call it the Admiral's Quarters or something like that? Yes, there's, on a cruiser, there's Admiral's Quarters. So that's where uh, they had been. And there was, you know, definitely, they put a guard out inside of the, or in front of the Admiral's Quarters during this time that they were staying there. But that's where they were. So it's just a, an area of the ship. It's, it's rather large. I've been in there before. It's where they stage their stuff. There's a bed in there. There's couches. There's plenty of room for whatever they needed. You, you mentioned that, you know, just a while ago, you mentioned you had to go back to, to the pier. But one of the things you had told me in a previous conversation was that these guys also um, retrieved some of the avionics or sensor equipment from your helicopters. Yes, which... they did do that. Um, I just don't I couldn't tell you what it was that they had taken mm -hmm. anymore. Um, but just that was that. That was the reason. It was something we couldn't fly our aircraft right. until we got them back in our aircraft. Right. So that was the reason why, you know, you just didn't fly back to the pier was because they had retrieved some. Is that correct? Is that why you couldn't yes, fly there back? Yes, there was something that they had taken off of our aircraft that whatever box it was or recorder, it, they, they logged it out. It was logged out by us, not by them. And it just, we put something to the effect of, you know, a higher authority directed by a higher authority to take this box. So, mm -hmm. but once we didn't have this box, whatever it was, there was no way we could safely fly our aircraft in a battle group anymore because they wouldn't be coming up as safe aircraft. And so then moving forward after that occurred, um, these gentlemen didn't fly. I was thinking they flew off the, the Princeton, but you say that they no, were they still there. No, they didn't fly off because they uh, rode the ship in that night. When I had gotten up to the um, the bridge, and we weren't even pulled into a pier at the time. We were sitting in, at an anchor in the middle of the harbor. You know, there was, I could see our rib boat in the distance going to, uh, I think it's called, I, well, I couldn't remember what pier it is, but it's, a, it's an ammo pier on North Island where a ship docks if they're fully loaded with their ammo. It's also where they load missiles on board ships as well. So they were... Uh, 
the guys, the officers from the previous night were going over to this pier from our ship, from the Princeton. And then you became aware because um, your CEO let you know that the this avionics equipment for your helicopter was a new one. Is that right? A new piece of equipment was going to be delivered to you guys? Yes, they were bringing it out to us. So they were meeting the rib. Basically, the, they were going to meet up with the rib at that same pier with the piece of equipment and bring it back to the ship so we could get the, into our aircraft again. You know, this is just fascinating to me. I mean, you know, it's, it's one thing to see just one thing, but it sounded like because you were, you know, kind of um, the lead petty officer of 20 people that basically your job was maintaining these helicopters that you became aware <laughs> that, well, not only um, do we have some uh, visitors to, to mm-hmm. Princeton, but they've they've um, rendered our helicopters uh, operationally ineffective by taking something um, out of them. Is that right? Yeah, pretty much. That's that's basically what it was. I mean, and I really hadn't even put it together that there was anything off this world that going on at the time. So, or you right. know what I mean? With dealing with the UFO, I couldn't even, I, I hadn't even put it all together. Right. Because I mean, like you said before, you were pretty busy just doing your job and it, it yeah. wasn't like that your job was intercepting Tic Tacs. It was maintaining helicopters, you know, so have you, you know, after that time, after that occurred, and, you know, now we're we're kind of in 2019 now, have you talked to any of the other guys, or did anyone ever talk about that afterwards as it being kind of strange? I mean, was that an occurrence that um, you had ever <laughs> experienced before with the people? You know, I, I tried to, to talk to a couple of people from back then about it, but I'm just hit with, I, I really have no clue what was going on out there, so, I mean... Mm-hmm. I guess if you say it was going on, like, I didn't know. It was just something that I, don't, I could tell you, I didn't even know the height of what I had witnessed until I saw your documentary, to be honest with you. And when I saw that, it, something clicked inside of me and I went, holy shit. So that's why we did this. That's why we did this. That's I remembered all of these things. And it, it started to make sense. The questions I had back then mm-hmm. when I saw your documentary. How out of the ordinary would that be when you look back at that sort of sequence of events there with the the guys arriving and then taking and then having to go back to the pier? I mean, how weird was that? That was I've done a lot of cruises in my time in the military. You know, I was in the Navy a long time, I was 15 years, and I did a lot of deployments and never once did we pull in during a workup to a harbor and anchor for any reason whatsoever. I mean, never. I've never even seen a, a ship anchor in, in the mouth of San Diego Harbor like they had done. And that was because you guys couldn't fly your helicopters because they took something off of them. Is that correct? That's correct. And then to drop them off, like these guys. And Yes. Yeah. And, and why? Because the Princeton is like the carrier's number one. We're, we're, whatever the carrier wants, we're, we're the number one for everything. Mm-hmm. So for the lead ship to leave the battle group away from the you know, carrier, and we were gone, and we were gone, you know, for two days of operations and training mm-hmm. that we missed. Right. So you know, we were gone for a lot, and for the to be the, you know, the biggest ship or support vessel for the carriers is, is a big deal. Yeah, I mean, I would love, obviously, if you talk to any of your uh, shipmates or, or squadron mates that you know, kind of remember that, I would really love to get a corroborating witness because obviously with this going down, there's going to be a lot of people that saw the same thing. And again, maybe they didn't think it was anything special. And let me ask you this. I mean, now that you know that, you know, that that they were looking at these UFOs during that intercept um, with the FLIR and so on, is it any doubt in your mind that that's what these guys were looking for? The data? No, No, there's no doubt. That's exactly they're, what they were seeing. They didn't know what they were seeing, but we were looking at it for quite a while and trying to figure out what the hell was going on. The whole battle group has a set training schedule that we have to adhere to to go out on our long cruise. And the last workup before you leave on cruise is the most important because it's where you do all of your inspections, everything, all the qualifications for the ship and the air detachments. That's where the last chance you can do them. So... So these people arrive and you feel that obviously they were confiscating or signing out 
what most likely was some type of sensor um, recordings, radar recordings, communications, CEC, yes. all these things that Gary and you know Patrick have talked about that their airplanes recorded, which would seem like they were interested in what the ships and what the CIC was seeing um, related to these UFOs. Now, do mm-hmm. you think that do you think there's any possibility that it could be a um, U.S. military secret project, some type of secret weapon that we have that you know they were? Cut- <laughs> you know, honestly, I I I've, I don't think so. <laughs> as much as you know the technology and, and the stuff that is out there in real life that I have seen. I've never seen anything like that. I've never heard of anything like what they were witnessing during this time frame. I mean, it's absolutely amazing. There's, uh, I couldn't think of anything it could be that would be man-made or military-made. Well, obviously, if it was that secret, it, pro- secret, it probably wouldn't have been the greatest idea to bring it out in front of five thousand sailors and you oh, know yeah. strike fighters and everyone else <laughs> to see it. Um, but maybe exactly. they—I don't know. Maybe they they figured that they could just say it was a UFO and no one would um, know know any different, but I don't know. Again, it's all speculation at this point. It's been, you know, all these years later, and I don't think anybody that's come forward has really any clue or an explanation. I mean, I certainly have heard a lot of theories, but so far that's all it's been, you know, speculation. So exactly. You ended up, that was your last cruise. You kind of ended up I don't, you know, do you want to talk about anything else, Ryan? I mean, I think that that kind of covers the story. I mean, that covers basically what I wanted to try and tell you. I know I might be jumping all over the place because I'm really excited over this, but, you know, um, no, 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 I think I got what I wanted to let you know. You know, I don't like hearing that, you know, people are discrediting your story, mm-hmm. especially if I personally am involved in this story and know that everything that I witnessed during this time frame. I'm crediting back to these guys that, that have come forward and told you about. Right. I mean, again, I think that, um, you know, what Jason said that he saw a longer video, I believe that he's being perfectly honest about that. And I think, again, you kind of reiterated seeing the same thing. You you said that it was more than a minute and a half of footage. We have P- Patrick Hughes saying that he witnessed people coming that were interested in the E2 Hawkeye CEC data bricks. So again, it's not, no one has ever said that the, these were like men in black or guy, you know, secret no. agents or anything. It, it seemed kind of like um, an official, an official business visit where you had people. Exactly. Were- there, there was somebody there and it's not something that you're not accustomed to seeing and- while you're out doing operations. And it seemed like the command structure, the brass, so to speak, would have known who these people were. It's just that they're not talking. This is something that they're not going to like be telling not us. About, for, right? no, oh, no need for us to know. So we're not going to be told about it. And it's something you yeah. get very used to in the military. <laughs> now you joke about all the time. So one other line of inquiry that you kind of helped me with is you mentioned that a lot of this stuff would be um, notated in. Uh, naval message traffic and what is that and what would be in naval message traffic naval message traffic has absolutely everything going on uh military wise for the navy it's it's got its ship the ship's doing something uh refueling out to sea any any and all the ships uh air detachments air somebody in another part of the world needs a part they can put out a, a message about it and the rest of us can see it so there's there was message traffic during this time frame about everything that was going on as well. I went out and I did a Freedom of Information Act request for the naval message traffic specifically to and from the helicopter squadron, the HSL 43 Detachment 5, during that time period, the entire month of November. And I got, quickly got a response back from the uh, Naval Air Force Pacific Command that said that, unfortunately, they don't keep those records or they're not required to keep those records after two years. And I'm mm-hmm. not sure exactly what all records are destroyed, but they said that those records were not available. I know another colleague of mine tried to get, for instance, um, aircraft uh, flight logs or, or summaries of the aircraft, the fighter jets and so on. And they, he was told the same thing, that the, all those logs have been destroyed, which is, you know, too bad. I mean, maybe they're there, but um, they, they're they don't have they're to probably somewhere blocked away but they're they're yeah you're not going to see them 
Right, because I, I mean, I, there's a lot of stuff. The, the through the mil, I know, like I said, I was in the military for 15 years, and yeah, we keep everything. And and I logs, think, naval. I mean, I've mess- seen logs from detachments 20 years old. It's like don't throw it away. I'm like all right, man, I'll keep it. Yeah, and naval message traffic would have been an email. It's not like a yeah, it, it's an email format, and it's probably saved. You know, it's somewhere in a in the world. I swear I have email from like 2001 on my computer. There's so much email on there. Yeah, so. I, I do too. I do too. There <laughs> is. <laughs> I don't usually delete it, but um, I don't, I don't think that the public will be seeing those. Unfortunately, that, that message traffic. Um, well, Hey, I appreciate you taking the time, you know, on a Friday night to talk to me and I hope your family's good and I hope you feel better with your back and um, appreciate your service, you know, in the Navy and everything. And I appreciate you contacting me because I hope, you know, your story leads to more people being interested in maybe even some other shipmates or squadron mates coming forward to support what, what you said, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I hope it does. I hope it does. you know, show these people that, you know, want to discredit something that is not discreditable, you know, more, more proof. So cool. I hope it does. If you or someone, you know, has witnessed unknown objects from military ships or planes, please contact us at the address on your screen. You can remain anonymous.